Welcome to Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting live on August 6th from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. Hurricane Debbie made landfall at 7 o'clock yesterday morning near Steenhatchee, and some areas in Tampa Bay got 9 inches or more of rain on Sunday. There's some river flooding. We'll tell you more about that later. There's street flooding, storm surge, wind, and power outages. But overall, the region escaped major damage. Later on in this hour, we're going to speak to a meteorologist from the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network. So I hope you prepare your questions right now. You can email us at dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885. You can also phone in at 813-239-9663 if you have any questions about the storm or about this first topic that we're going to consider, which is the special case of older adults and storms. So let us know your experiences or your questions. Again, that's 813-239-9663. Our guest to talk about this is, is University of South Florida College of Behavioral and Community Sciences professor Lindsay Peterson. Lindsay is an assistant professor of aging studies whose research is on the impact of hurricanes and other disasters on older adults. Welcome to Tuesday Cafe, Lindsay. Hi, I'm happy to be here. I'm yes. so glad you could be on. Thanks so much. And uh, so preparing for and going through a storm is really fresh on our audience's minds right now. So I thought I'd bring you on to talk specifically about storm prep for older adults and things that we should be thinking about. So we'll get to specific tips and strategies in just a bit. But what do people who are caring for older adults have to keep in mind when preparing for storms? Um, one thing is that it's, it's usually always um, going to be different from you expect. Uh, sometimes it, it will be a lot less than what you expect, but as we learned just this past weekend, it can be very different and much worse than what you expect. And I think a lot of people feel like, you know, I've, I've been through a lot of these, I can handle it. Um, I know, uh, you know, under, I understand the needs of the person that I care for and will be okay. Um, but very often, when things become chaotic, especially when you're dealing with someone who has some kind of cognitive impairment, um, it raises the you know the level of of stress and anxiety and predictability and unpredictability to to a much greater extent that uh, can just throw a big wrench into your plans. And so, the more someone prepares, the more someone thinks through what may happen and thinks about the worst and actually takes some steps, maybe some practice, uh, the better able they're going to be able to deal with the unexpected thing that happens um, or kind of the crisis, maybe the emotional crisis that results. Say you've got someone who is refusing to leave the house. Uh, you know, ordinarily they don't have a problem running, leaving the house, but, but they're scared about what's happening and, and they, they will not go. So you need to think about how you're going to do that. Um, I know we interviewed a lot at several caregivers for this research that we did, and one of them was totally surprised that when she started to board up her house, put up the, the hurricane shutters, uh, her father, whom she cared for, freaked out. Um, there, He felt like he was being shut in. He refused to stay in the house with the shutters on. And this is something she had never thought about before and had to deal with right there at the time while they're trying to put the shutters up. And so whatever it is, it's a matter of thinking through what, what this person's needs are every day on a normal basis and how you're going to meet those needs when everything is very abnormal and all the emotion and anxiety is, is ratcheted up. I want to remind people that our guest is University of South Florida College of Behavioral and Community Sciences Professor Lindsay Peterson, and we're talking about older adults, people who are caring for older adults and storms and storm preparation. And so far as some of the advice that we've had is to prepare for is anything that could happen. A lot, can, a lot of different things could happen and just be prepared. So you are um, developing an app, a mobile phone, I guess, app to assist older adults in disaster preparedness, decision making, and things like whether to evacuate or to shelter in place. What are some of the, as you're developing this app, what are some of the kind of um, points of decision and concerns that, that people should start to be thinking about? Yeah, well beforehand, you need to think about, should I stay or should I go? 
And, and that's a pretty basic instrumental decision that you can make based on the location of your house, uh, the resilience of your house, um, what may happen. Uh, first off, think about what may happen because then every decision flows from that. And so this is how we organize it. It's one of those um, kind of tools where you, you're asked some questions and, and you make some choices. And based on the choices you make, it takes you to a next set of questions. And so that first one is what, what's likely to happen or what do I need to be prepared for? Uh, you know, it could be a fire, could be wildfire, um, could, be, could be flood, could be wind, um, anything that's possible. I mean, even, you know, we, we learned with the pandemic, what do we do if we have to be confined here together? Um, and so then this is pretty much designed at this point for hurricanes. So the next question is, is where am I? Am I in a flood zone? And, you know, what's, am I near the coast? And even if I am near the coast, what's my risk? But even if I'm not near the coast, I might still face some risk because I've got a stream nearby. And one thing, again, that we learned this weekend is that places that are far, far from the coast um, can, can experience deadly flooding. And this this happened right where I was living. I live near the, the Manatee River Dam and we had to evacuate yesterday morning because they had to do an emergency release of water from the dam. And this is something I had never thought about before. You know, it's very, very hard to think about what, think about the kind of thing that's unlikely to happen. But, but as I was saying earlier, that's the main thing to do. But so for here in Florida, First off, you think about where am I located? What's my flood risk? What's my risk of, of going underwater? <laughs> and then if you don't have that risk, there's a series of other things you need to think about. Is my house, will my house stand up to a hurricane? Uh, do I have hurricane shutters? Do I need them? Um, will my roof stay on? What do I need to do to try to take care of some of these things? And there's some kind of little basic things we have in there. For instance, if you have a garage, and if you can shut the garage door, there are ways to secure that garage door. And some research that came out of Hurricane Andrew a long, long time ago showed that if you can simply secure your garage door, that you go a long way toward protecting your entire house. So these are the kind of basic things to think about that that we emphasize with this, because these are things that are that you can think about beforehand just describing your situation. And from there, it goes on to what you need to do in this situation or that situation. And so we we pose a series of questions about if you're gonna evacuate, where are you going to go? Um, how, the person you care for or yourself or whomever you're with, a, a child, an adult, anybody, how long are they able to ride? And what do you need to take with you? So plan out your trip. How many, you know, how much gasoline is it going to take? What do you need to have along the way? You know, not just to ensure that people are taken care of, you know, that they have their medication. Medication is huge, huge, huge. Um, but that they would have the food they need. And especially someone who is likely to be anxious, a child or an older adult, you know, you need to bring some things along to create a sense of familiarity, a sense of comfort and anything to reduce the sense of anxiety and panic. So think about all those things you need to have with you, not just for the physical safety and security, but for emotional security also. And think about the things that you're gonna need when you, when you are at your destination. And then there's a whole other series of things that are very similar that you need to have at home. And I'm just, I'll say one of those things is multiple light sources, because you could be thrust into darkness, especially, well, if your house is boarded up and your electricity goes off at any time of the day, you're going to be in darkness. And again, that can be a very, very difficult um, and panicky situation for, for someone, especially someone with dementia. And so there's ways to plan for that. How can I ensure I have light all around? How can I ensure that I have batteries for all the lights that I have? Um, how can I ensure I've got the foods that people want to eat? Uh, kind of think it all through beforehand. And those are all things, uh, many of these are things that you can get beforehand and you can plan your um, your responses. How are you going to explain what's happening, uh, whether, whether you're at home or whether you're traveling? 
And, uh, and a lot of these are, whether you're traveling or whether you're at home, a lot of it is the same. Basically when you're traveling, you just kind of have to, you have to be a, a rolling residence, you know, have all those things with you. But again, I want to emphasize medication. It's really important to have all the medications that you need on hand, possibly for a long period of time. After Hurricane Irma, a lot of places were cut off for a good, good while. And um, a lot of places were without electricity for more than two weeks. And so that's another thing to think about. How am I going to survive without any source of electricity? So one other thing is really good to have a lot of those little battery packs, those things that you can plug your cell phone and other devices in to ensure you have power. So that's a really important thing, is having, having a, a power supply so you can contact people. And the other super important thing is to make sure that you've told your friends and family what the plan is. And if you're going to be home or if you're going to be traveling, where you're going to be and stay in touch with someone as soon as you possibly can before the crisis occurs and then make a plan to be in touch with them at some point in the future, say if it's a hurricane after the hurricane has passed, maybe even a place to meet up, but a way for people to know what's happening and where they can find you if they need to and what they need to do if, if they can't get in touch with you. Contact, social contacts are super important, especially with someone who's, who's possibly outside the zone um, who would not be cut off themselves, who would be able to come and try to reach you or contact some emergency people who might need to do that. Our guest is Lindsay Peterson, University of South Florida College of Behavioral and Community Sciences professor. Lindsay is an assistant professor of aging studies whose research is on the impact of hurricanes and other disasters on older adults. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we are broadcasting live from the studios of WMNF Tampa on August 6th. So if you have any questions or if you have to would like to share your story, you can email us at dj at wmnf.org. You can text 813-433-0885, or you can phone in at 813-239-9663. And we, you, one of the things that you were talking about, Lindsay, was evacuations. But I imagine that the, the population that we're talking about, older adults or possibly people with cognitive impair, impaired, uh, that are cognitively impaired, might have a resistance to evacuation. Is that something that you found? Yes, a lot of people, um, a lot of people don't want to evacuate of all ages. And we do focus on older adults, and I think rightly so in a certain way because older adults are more vulnerable. Um, they're more likely to suffer a heart attack, um, have a stroke. I mean, this is what happens after storms where we see much, you know, much higher level of of death and and hospitalization after hurricanes and other tragedies, because people are more likely to have a, a heat stroke, for instance, they're more uh, vulnerable. And we've had so many issues with heat and will continue to have, and I know they're talking about defining heat now as, as distinct disasters, um, but it's much, uh, older bodies have a much a, a lower tolerance to rising temperatures. Um, so it's much more important that um, that someone who has any level of vulnerability is taken out of a dangerous situation. Uh, oh, younger people uh, possibly can survive. I mean, this sounds kind of horrible, but during Hurricane Ian that brought so much flooding to the Fort Myers area, you know, people told stories about having to swim away from where they were and having to swim over to the, you know, and grab onto the balcony of the condo nearby. Um, with the water up to the like second story of that condo. And that's something someone can do at a certain age. You can't necessarily do that when you're 80 or 90, and especially if you're confused and um, maybe are not even mobile. So it's much, much more, more important to think about that. But there's a reluctance all across the board for people to evacuate. And sometimes it can be more more pronounced with someone who is older because if they are they're in a home, for instance, this could be their last possessions. This could be their la the last place they're going to live. It's kind of easy when you're younger to think, oh, it's just stuff. I can replace it. It's harder when you're older to think that to think this. I I can't imagine leaving this place. And 
And, and that does happen. Sometimes people just delay they, and they delay for too long. And we still don't quite know exactly where these things are going to hit. And, and in the case of Hurricane Ian, um, they by the time they had a really good idea it, when and where it was going to hit, um, it was a little too late to get out on the road. And a lot of people tried and, and they died in that process too. So it comes down to a point of, um, if I leave, am I going to be at risk? And especially, you know, with an older person and you've got someone who's caregiving for an older person, the idea of sitting in traffic for five hours, it's, it's unthinkable. It's, it would not be possible with, with people in certain situations. And so that's what shelters are for. And there are, there are public shelters in every county and special needs shelters for people who have certain needs for electrical devices and they might have some medical personnel there. And people need to make use of those shelters and there's a huge reluctance to do that on the part of, of people, especially older adults and people caring for an older adult, um, particularly if they have dementia because they're worried about what how they may react in the foreign environment because these shelters are, are noisy and can be chaotic. Um, now, I've been hearing about shelters that are working really hard to try to create um, softer and quieter areas for people. They do this in airports. We have these comfort rooms in airports. And, and so there's a discussion about trying to replicate those in shelters. And I think it, that would make a big difference. I know the Alzheimer's Association right now, I'm working with them on um, their efforts to train shelter workers. And a lot of workers are trained in dementia, but still trying to kind of take, increase the level of training they have and it's and improve the environment that they're in. And so, but when it comes down to it, uh, it's really important to communicate to, to people, caregivers and older adults that um, the shelter is better, is better than the, than the horror of being stuck in their house and being stuck in a flooded house or a home that, that is destroyed. Because once where we hear this this often from the emergency managers is that there's a period of time right before the storms hit and afterward where it's impossible for anybody to come out and rescue people and they all these 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 requests for rescue in the you know immediate hours after after these things happen and they just can't get out and get to everybody so people will be stuck and so that's that's another thing to to think about that we all need to work on is how to make the shelters better, but how to how to convince people or, or, and how to be prepared to take someone to a shelter. And that's there are there are steps that that you can take when, as a caregiver um, to try to do your best to try to, to make the environment more more tolerable. But this this reluctance to evacuate is universal. It's just much more important for people who are vulnerable. When a storm is approaching, uh, you know, I know I have go-to sources. Um, I, I have certain uh, Twitter handles, or I guess they're called now X, or websites that I would go to to access emergency information about to, knowing what to expect, how to prepare. But I imagine there will be barriers to access for some of these things for people with cognitive impairments or people who are um, aging. So what what would you suggest or what do we know about access to emergency information for this population? Um, there is a ton of information out there, and that is actually the problem. It's, it's almost too much. Um, there's some really excellent guides that I have found in doing this research that FEMA's put together and other organizations have put together on how to how to prepare um, as a caregiver, you know, how to prepare for yourself and the person you care for. And one thing that we learned in the research that we did with, with with actual caregivers is one they weren't aware of any of this. They didn't know where to find it. They would they they and these were people who did a lot of uh, they spent a lot of time online looking up information to try to understand other ways to help provide care for the the person. But um, a lot of them didn't know about these resources and the ones they knew about. It's like I'm not going to read a ten page guide. And I just don't, you know, they don't have the time, the energy, and especially when so many caregivers are being, you know, they're dealing with daily issues. And so that's, that's one of the things that we are trying to tackle with this app. And with that, we, we 
the first thing we did is we created kind of a simplified guide for caregivers of people with dementia that the Alzheimer's Association has on its website um, for the, the in Florida. Um, but this app is designed to try to make it make it as simple as possible. And there's sort of a sweet spot there because there's information that you have to elicit and provide, um, but to not overwhelm people. But it is, for someone who does have the time and the energy, there is a lot of information out there. Just, you know, randomly Googling disaster preparedness for caregivers will bring up a lot. Um, but there's a lot of really valuable information from FEMA. I was, I have to say, you know, we all have an idea about FEMA and what FEMA does, but FEMA produces some really high quality um, research-based uh, information on disaster preparedness, you know, you know, based on the research about how things have to be fairly simplified. They've got these one, two, three guides. And so FEMA is a great source of information on disaster preparedness for older adults and for people who are caregivers. But also I, I want to say that the county emergency management offices have a lot of real specific information about how to figure out where the shelters are and um, what zone you may be in, in terms of whether you need to evacuate. And the zones go, I think probably everybody knows, they go from A all the way up with um, the lower letters being the higher vulnerability areas, A being the, usually the first ones to be evacuated. But they will start releasing information right away um, as a storm is on the horizon about what they know and what they are recommending that people do. And so there are ways to sign up to get this information. And, and it's pretty easy to do. And I would recommend people contact their county emergency management office to find out how they can be on this list of where you're gonna receive regular text messages. You can register with the state of Florida special needs registry. And that is something I recommend that everybody do. This puts a person on the radar for the state in terms of uh, the state uses this for planning. Now, they won't go to your house and get you when you register for the state registry, the register is on the special needs list. Um, but they do know about you. And this is how they determine how to how to establish resources for when a storm comes. But the person needs to register with the shelter that they would go to. So you need to register twice. And it, it, so there's some barriers to this, but this is the way it works now. You need to register with the state to let the state know that you're there and kind of what the needs are. But then specifically to go to a shelter, um, a person, if they want to go to a special needs shelter, it, it, this applies most of all. Um, they need to contact the shelter and let the shelter know they're coming and what the needs are of the person that th themselves and the person that they're bringing. And that's information that they can get from their at a county level, from their county emergency management office. And that's it's it, it, the other thing about this is it, you can't really do this in advance because they don't. There's a lot of potential shelter locations, but they don't actually designate them and get them up and running and let people know where they should go until fairly quickly before the storm comes. So it's just a matter of monitoring, you know, beginning to look, uh, making sure beforehand that you're on the list of people who will receive these notices. But then as the time is coming, we all kind of know these things a little bit beforehand, at least three or four days. So at that point, make sure that you're going to be receiving notices from from emergency officials about what's going to happen next. And a lot of people will say, you know, get yourself a weather radio. That's really cool to have because you can tune in and you can hear everything and and kind of know exactly where the storm is and what and you'll know everything that the emergency officials know. So far, we've talked mostly about people who are maybe living with a caregiver, perhaps. But the governor's office said last night that there were five assisted living facilities and three nursing homes that were reporting evacuation. So what kinds of special concerns would you have if your loved one is in an assisted living or in nursing home? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, nursing homes in particular are required by the federal government. The nurse, nursing homes are federally uh, regulated because uh, they take Medicare. 
And so the federal government requires some pretty specific disaster management plans of all nursing homes. And additionally, at, at the this, this state level, both nursing homes and assisted living communities are required to have plans that they update annually, that they submit to the county emergency management office and receive approval for by that county emergency management office. So the best thing I think for a family member to know is what's the what's the emergency plan? You know, that's a written down document that they could see or that they could talk to the administrator about. And um, these facilities kind of have to go through the same planning process I was talking about earlier, and that is assessing what the risk is likely to be and how they're going to respond, depending upon what this risk is that is occurring. And with hurricanes, there's been they've had a lot of experience in Florida with hurricanes, and it's not gone so well in the past. Um, I think Hurricane Irma was one that showed that Irma hit pretty much affected the whole state. And there were a lot of places that made evacuation plans and they had plans for for buses to come and take people to these evacuation sites. But what happened was the places they were gonna evacuate to also were evacuating and the buses that were gonna take them um, were being used by other people. And so these these plans now have to be three and four, th three and four items deep. You know, don't just have one place to go to, have five or six different places that you could possibly go to. Um, and so family members can know this and they should know this. And there's always, there's supposed to be a family communication plan in for assisted living communities and nursing homes. And so the families should be receiving updates and should be receiving information about how to contact the facility uh, if they have to evacuate to know where the facility is going to go, where the residents are going to go, and how to reach them there. And so this is stuff that all needs to be written down and planned for. And unexpected things happen. Though these, both nursing homes and assisted living communities do, they do evacuate a lot. And one of our, and this is a little bit counterintuitive, but one of the things that came out of some earlier research we did is that evacuation is not good for assisted living and nursing home residents, that there's a higher the risk of mortality and hospitalization, death and hospitalization um, in those who were evacuated. Now it's absolutely necessary in a lot of cases, but both, so nursing homes and assisted living facilities, if, they, if they're not quite sure what to do, sometimes they'll err on the side of staying because that is better for the resident. And so this is something that, uh, you know, families need to kind of be aware of and think about, and they will give families the option of taking the person home with them if they want to. And this, this doesn't always work out. The one thing they learned during Irma was that families would take the person home and, and need to bring them back fairly quickly, especially if it was someone with dementia. So a family needs to realize if you're going to bring a family member home, you need to understand exactly what their needs are and be ready to take care of them. Um, well, Lindsay, we're going to have to leave it there. I'm so sorry, yes. but thank you so much for all the great information. Really appreciate it. Uh, thanks so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe. Well, you're welcome. Thank you. I really appreciate all the information. Lindsay Peterson is a professor at, in the University of South Florida College of Behavioral and Community Sciences. And you are listening to Tuesday Cafe, broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we're broadcasting live on August 6th. And if you'd like to call in and, and uh, share your stories or ask your questions before we, we're going to talk shortly with a meteorologist, you can give us a call at 813-239-9663. You can also email us at dj at wmnf.org. Well, right now I want to bring in our meteorologist, Megan Borowski. Welcome to, back to WMS Tuesday Cafe, Megan. It's always great to be here, Sean. I appreciate you coming on. I know you're super busy this week. You're a meteorologist with the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network. So maybe this will be a good time to just remind people, what is FPREN? Absolutely, Sean. Um, so we are a group of meteorologists. Uh, we work out of WUFT uh, on the campus of the University of Florida. Uh, but the beautiful thing about our group is we provide weather coverage and updates for our uh, NPR and all our radio partner stations across the state of Florida. Um, so we are, are covering it and, and bringing information before hard hitting weather events and during hard hitting weather events when it when it matters most. So you'll hear us on the air uh, if we have a tropical system threatening uh, your immediate area. 
or if there's a cold front or, or some sort of uh, very impactful weather event. Uh, when you won't hear us is when it's nice outside and sunny and 75. That's when you don't need our broadcasts. Um, but, you know, when when there's an emergency situation like we had with, with Debbie yesterday and still ongoing for parts of North Florida, that is when we are here to communicate any and every piece of information that can keep the, the public safe. I think right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe in the Tampa Bay region, the thing to watch out for the most right now is because of all the rain that we got is river flooding. We are under, in, in different counties, we're under river uh, flood advisories and warnings. Um, what do we know about how much rainfall the region got and how, why that's a danger to the river flooding? Absolutely. So, um, you know, yesterday storm totals that that started to trickle in after the bulk of Debbie's rain shield moved out moved out was uh, anywhere between a half a foot and over a foot of rain. Parts of um, uh, near Sarasota and also near Bradenton recorded about 16 inches of rain. There were local reports there. Um, eight to 10 inches aren't out of the realm of possibility uh, farther inland over in the inner Hillsborough County. Um, as well. And so, you know, all this rain needs to go somewhere. And over the next few days, it is going to attempt to drain through local waterways um, out in into the Gulf. But these waterways are inundated right now. And another threat that we're going to have for the rest of the day uh, today and really even to the start of the day tomorrow are some quickly moving um, bands on the southern edge of the circulation of Debbie. Debbie right now is crawling. Um, over uh, southeastern Georgia and South Carolina. It has a very slow forward motion. And so we're going to be on the edge, the southern edge of circulation for pretty much most of the day today. And, and we'll have the potential for quickly moving downpours over our area. They'll be isolated. Right now we do have a few near Lake Okeechobee and then southward toward Alligator Alley. So none really in, in the vicinity of, of the Tampa metro. However, we'll have that chance and really any additional moderate to heavy rainfall is just going to exacerbate the situation. Um, and, you know, the, the flooding of creeks and rivers will, will likely continue uh, for rest of the, the week, especially for locations closer to I-4. As the storm was approaching, uh, we were seeing warnings for storm for storm surge mm -hmm. of two to four feet in the Tampa Bay area and mm -hmm. higher than that where the landfall was expected and eventually came ashore at Steenhatchee around there. Uh, what do we know about how much storm surge in Tampa Bay and what the worst storm surges were in the state? Is that something that you have? I don't have um, the any official recordings right up in front of me. Um, I will say that it, it seemed like as the event was unfolding that the NHC forecast was verifying, especially uh, closer toward where the storm made landfall. I did see imagery coming out of out of Tampa Bay from emergency managers of flooding of roads that directly, you know, paralleled the bay. I saw Bay Shore was flooded. Um, so I would assume right now that those forecasts did verify that we did get two to four feet uh, in the Tampa Bay area. But as you know, meteorologists get to, to go out and do those storm surveys, um, we'll know for certain. Um, and as we get those readings uh, from tide gauges and things like that, we'll know for certain if the storm, um, if the actual forecast verified. But I, I can tell you from the imagery that I saw, uh, flooding was was pretty substantial leading up to the storm as well on uh, on Saturday and Sunday in Tampa Bay. We were told to be on the lookout for in case there were tornadoes during the storm, and we got quite a number of tornado warnings. In fact, even today, I was, I saw on the Florida Storms Twitter app, or, or the the um, X on X on you guys were posting that Orange County and Seminole County had a, a tornado warning this morning. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the, these bands that you were talking about that are so far south of the center, which is in Georgia and South Carolina, but mm -hmm. we're still have the possibility of isolated tornadoes. Absolutely. And so that's something to always consider. And we always try to communicate that when there's a tropical system threatening uh, a particular region, you could be hundreds of miles from the center of the storm, but you could still have quite impactful and, and life threatening weather. Um, you know, we saw that even several years ago in the lead up to Hurricane Ian. Of course, you know, that storm made, made landfall in the, um, you know, on down in the Fort Myers area. Uh, but several days before landfall, we had hurricane outbreaks um, down toward the Miami metro area. So, um, you know, even though Debbie is, the bulk of Debbie is now over Georgia and South Carolina, we'll still have those threats today. And even with these, these bands on the southern edge, they're, Tornadoes aren't as frequent on the, the southern uh, half of, of circulation of a tropical system. However, they are, are possible, and we will likely see a few more warnings today. Um, and something to keep in mind, too, is 
these bands are very quickly moving. And so um, when you see these tornado warnings come out, it will likely, you know, mention in the storm motion that they're racing at like 40 or 50 or 60 miles an hour. So if a tornado warning is issued for your area uh, at any time, and, and today especially, heed those alerts immediately because these storms can quickly arrive to your area and take you off guard. So have a way to get alerts. We can't stress that enough. Enable them on your, on your cell phone um, and, and make sure that you have a place to go. You know where that place is that you would shelter if an alert is issued for your area. It really could be the difference between life and death. And someplace you might shelter would be an interior room, for example, in a bathroom or, or something like that, if it's in the interior of a house? Absolutely. You want to put as much distance between yourself and the outside and the, the storm as possible, because the, the threat here is going to be debris that's lofted into the air. Um, you know, that can, you know, obviously um, kill you if, if it lodges, you know, if it, if it hits you. So you want to put as much distance between yourself and the outside, be away from windows, any, any glass that could break. So a bathroom is a good, a good spot on the lowest level of the floor. Um, in the bathtub, if you have a, a mattress that you could drag into the bathroom and put on top of you, I know that could be a little logistically difficult. Uh, something that might be easier to do is have a bicycle helmet um, or, or some sort of helmet uh, that you can strap on, uh, you know, if you have an alert and you need to, to run into the bathroom there. Just taking five minutes to think about where you would shelter, identify that location, um, even in your workplace, identify where you would go, have that in your brain. That way, if an alert is issued, you can just enact the plan and you don't have to think, where do I go? Um, it, it's these little things that can really make a difference uh, when, when the weather uh, turns violent and dangerous. Our guest is Megan Borowski, a meteorologist with the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan, and we're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF Tampa. We're talking about Hurricane Debbie, Tropical Storm Debbie now, and uh, some things that we've learned over the last few days of watching this storm. One of the things is that the governor said about 17,000 linemen were mobilized to assist with power restoration efforts as needed. Uh, how widespread have the power outages been and has how power been restored for most of Florida? Um, I don't have the outage map pulled up in front of me. I can tell you we, we were tracking it, um, you know, roughly uh, as the storm was making landfall. And the majority of our power outages were in, in the vicinity of landfall. So over, you know, Dixie, Taylor, Lafayette County, Swanee counties, over the Big Bend where you had um, the, the strongest winds, I can tell you. Um, you know, we're broadcasting here in Gainesville um, from, from the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network. When I was headed into the studio yesterday in Gainesville, it was about three o'clock in the morning, and, and we had some pretty stiff winds even farther inland. We did have power outages across uh, Alachua County as well. I can um, pull up the, the flat, um, power outage map really quickly and, and give you just a rough estimate, um, you know, to, to take a look and see how many customers have been restored uh, looks like over the state of Florida, yeah, the, the worst of our outages are, are still over Taylor and Dixie counties, Lafayette County, even Jefferson County, uh, just, just east of the state capital. Alachua is not as bad. Um, really looks like the extent of it is, is that bullseye, though, in the path of landfall with the worst of it uh, just along and, and just inland of that Big Bend region. Um, I would assume, you know, the, the linemen are, are working around the clock. Um, to get it down. Right now, it looks like about 109,000 customers are out. This is according to, to one website. I, I wouldn't, you know, take, um, you know, these numbers a uh, 100%, but I, I would say roughly 100,000 customers are, are still out in Florida, which uh, we know that for those 100,000 customers, that is not, not the ideal situation. Um, however, you know, we're, we're thankful that it's, it's not worse um, because the linemen can focus on that particular region. And, and try to get those customers um, back, you know, powered up as soon as possible. With the winds, of course, there's going to be tree limbs down and, and mm -hmm. other debris. The governor's office said the DEP has issued an emergency final order allowing for the activation of disaster debris management sites to store and process storm generated solid waste and debris. So if people uh, have debris on their um, on their property, and they are concerned that they don't want it to become a projectile in the next storm, whether there's a tornado warning or or whether, you know, we get a hurricane in, in a few weeks or whatever. Uh, what would you recommend? I don't know if I'm going beyond your scope, but what would you recommend for people to do with the debris that's on their property? 
Um, well, first of all, I would say know your limits. Uh, first of all, check conditions if you're going to head outside and attempt to, to clean up. Um, you know, if I know there's a wind advisory in effect up here for us in North Central Florida, it doesn't extend as far south as, as uh, the Tampa metro area. However, check conditions in your immediate area. Do not attempt to clean up if, you know, you have an outer band coming through, if, if winds are, are picking up, um, because that puts you in the immediate line of danger. Know your physical limits. Um, do you, do not exert yourself um, and, and cause a health problem. If, you know, if you have physical limitations, do not attempt to be a, a hero uh, and, and clean things up in your yard because you'll, you'll only test the limits of your physical ability there. I would also say, you know, check with your local municipalities and with your local counties uh, officials because I, I'm sure they have more information on um, the exact details of, of storm debris cleanup of where to put it for, for um, public works to, to pick up as well. But my two recommendations though there um, from the weather side of things is make sure conditions are okay before you venture outside and also you know take those physical precautions as well. All right, so that is Hurricane Debbie. We want to talk now, just uh, before we wrap up here, about preparing for the next storm. I know, um, you know, people might be thinking it's late in the hurricane season, but there's still so much more of hurricane season to come, and we could get more and more storms. So what should people be doing right now to prepare for the next storm? Well, I would say assess um, what happened to your property with this event. This was a... A multi-day event for the Tampa area. Uh, we had outer bands come through on Saturday as, as the system was just entering the Gulf. So we had about three days, and if you count today, uh, four days of impacts from Debbie. But they they aren't as you know bad as they could be. I mean, we could have a, a storm impacting, you know, the eye wall impacting the immediate area. So assess what went well with your storm prep for this for this event. Assess the vulnerabilities of your property, maybe where um, you know the preventative measures or where your plan failed, um, and come up with with an actionable plan where you can reinforce your property, where you can reinforce your emergency kit, make that emergency plan better. Um, because we can tell you there will be another storm. When that storm will be, I can't tell you right now. Um, it might be this season. It might be next season. But use this storm as kind of a, a learning experience and give yourself a grade on, on your uh, your preparation and how well you executed it and go in and, and make it better. Um, you know, the goal here is to have as little impact to your property and, and to preserve your life when, when these really dangerous storms come on through. And so um, making those plans better, that, that is my biggest suggestion. And a hurricane prep kit should include what? Um, enough water, uh, a gallon per person per day. I would say anywhere from from three to five days. I know that's that is a lot uh, of of volume in in wherever you're living. Um, I would say you know non perishable food items. Uh, if those are cans, make sure you either get cans with a pop top or with a can opener. That's happened a lot where you. Get the cans, but not a can opener, a mechanical one. Uh, a NOAA radio, um, either one that, that's bat battery operated, uh, make sure you have batteries, or a hand crank radio. Um, I would say, you know, very basic tools to to put in, um, you know, hardware hardware tools to to keep your house at least, um, you know, as a safe shelter during a storm. So I would say a tarp and things to secure that tarp. Um, sturdy footwear. Or in the aftermath of the storm, if you're going to be needing to, to go out and about walking, comfortable and functional clothing that will keep you covered and, and safe. Um, any sanitary items that, that are important as well, hand sanitizer, things like that to, to keep yourself clean. Um, one other thing, Sean, that I, I have to stress is, you know, any medications that are, are necessary on a daily basis. This isn't your vitamins and supplements and, and things, you know, um, like that. This is the, you know, um, medications that you need to, to keep, keep yourself functioning and, and alive. So assess that with your doctors. I do believe that um, you are able to get an emergency supply of, of those um, essential medications. And please do not forget your pets either. I'm a big uh, proponent <laughs> of pets and animals and animal lover. Um, so don't forget your pets either. Um, have a, a food bowl, have, you know, enough dry food or, or non-perishable food uh, to keep them safe, any of their medications as well. 
Um, you know, it, it's a lot, it's a long list and, and, you know, only, you know, the needs of your family, the immediate needs of your family. And so that's why I stress, you know, pre-season during season, when things are quiet, really think about what you need, um, not luxuries, but what you need and, and have that assembled and ready to go. In addition to those, you know, food, water, and shelter items, I also stress, um, any legal documents, proof of identification and, and cash, have all those on hand, something else to do before a storm hits is to go around your property and take pictures. Um, and this will help with insurance claims after the storm, um, you know, to, to prove um, what, you know, your property looked like before and then to, to show the damage afterward. Um, so, so thinking about those things as well, the proof of identification, proof that you own, own your, your property, um, those things. If you're going to evacuate tank of gas, um, Sean, I could go on and on, but, um, you know, the documents and, and non-perishable food and, and clothing and water are the main ones. And my last question to you, Megan, is uh, you are looking at the tropical weather all the time. You're, you're looking ahead. Do we see, do we know of any storm systems that are on the horizon? So NHC actually, I believe it was on Sunday as we were prepping hard for Debbie, they identified an area of interest uh, over the Caribbean. Um, it's just to the southeast of uh, Hispaniola, so um, it's, and it's just actually to the north of the, the islands of, of South America on the north edge there. Um, it does have a 30% chance for developing over the next seven days. Um, however, it does look like if something did develop, um, it would stay very, very well to the south of our area. I can check, you know, one model run really quickly here while we're on the air so you have the, the latest and greatest information. Um, I don't see any evidence of this really organizing too much. Um, and even if it did, it would likely impact Central America or the Yucatan uh, Peninsula of, of Mexico. So thankfully, nothing right now on the horizon to worry about. But as we all know, this can quickly change. Um, we monitor tropical waves uh, ejecting off the coast of Africa. Um, and so we'll continue to do that. Hopefully we have a little bit of quiet time at the very least. Um, so the folks in the Big Bend and really over Southeast Georgia and South Carolina can can assess um, assess the damage and at least start to recover a little bit. Well, I know I said that that was my last question, but Wendy just wrote in and asked if you know when the next tax-free hurricane tax break is again, because she heard it covers animal supplies. Um, I know there's a second one. I believe it's around the time of Labor Day, and I will look that up right now um, because that is a very great question. So second one, it begins on August 24th, and it ends on September 6th of this year. Um, and it looks like on here, I believe they did add pet, yes, pet supplies, um, pet beds, cat litter, dry food, pet carriers, portable kennels, over-the-counter pet medications, collars, leashes. There's a whole list. If you navigate to floridarevenue.com, um, they have on their website a list of all the eligible supplies. Not only, um, you know, not only your, um, you know, human supplies, but also pet supplies and home supplies as well. So I would say check that out. We'll also have articles coming out on our social media pages um, where you can really look at that list. That is a great um, great week to take an opportunity of, of the tax break. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on Tuesday Cafe, Megan. Absolutely. Anytime and uh, stay safe out there. Good luck with, with all the river flooding and the recovery there. Thanks. And thanks for all your work with the Florida Public Radio Emergency Network. Megan Borowski is a meteorologist with FPREN, and she's been our guest on Tuesday Cafe today.